and that he was running out of welterweight challenges. And uh, in order to get opponents, he would go into the next division. And one of the fighters he faced was the Bronx Bull, Jake LaMotta. Sugar Ray's first fight with Jake LaMotta was in late 1942 in New York City. Sugar Ray won in 10 rounds. He was offered a rematch with LaMotta in Detroit. LaMotta upset Robinson. Now keep in mind, LaMotta might have had 19 pounds on him. Well, naturally, he wanted a rematch. But he took a tune-up fight before the rematch. Two weeks after fighting LaMotta, he beats Jackie Wilson. One week after the Wilson fight, he fights LaMotta again and defeats LaMotta. Three fights within 21 days and two within eight days. The great tragedy is that none of his great fights in his prime were ever filmed. We will never see this guy at his absolute peak where he can knock you out with one punch with either hand. It's like not having the Sinatra recordings from the 50s. Uh, there's like, we can only imagine it from the old faded newspaper clips. From the time he lost the first fight to LaMotta in 1943 to 1951, that eight-year time span, he went undefeated in 93 professional fights. This is a phenomenal streak. He was a tremendous puncher, but he then knock you dead, puncher. Knock you dead, and the terrific finisher. He could knock you out going backwards. He could knock you out going forward. And that's why people remember him now as the greatest fighter we've ever had out of the town. His use of rhythm, his timing, his footwork. Ray Robinson was the greatest combination of speed and power that ever came together in one fighter. And he had a sense of strategy, too. The overall fight he knew where it was going and how to bide his time and what to deal with in the early rounds in order to accomplish this in the late rounds. This man was the ultimate warrior in the ring. He was the ultimate dispatcher of a foe. He was a, a distance fighter, an in fighter, very scientific, beautiful to see. And he made this brutal, uncivilized, barbaric sport ballet. Ray Robinson was the perfect fighter because he had no weakness. He had one of the greatest chins of all time. He was never really knocked out in a 25-year career. Another special thing about Robinson, how many times he was able to get off the floor to win. He always rose to the occasion. Don't give him a rematch. Because once you beat him that way, you'd be sure that the next time he'd adjust and he'd know what to do. Nobody beat Ray twice until he was 40 years old. His intelligence, his versatility, and his will to win for the reason he won all those rematches. He created a new place for the imagination of a fighter, the way Louis Armstrong or Frank Sinatra or Marlon Brando opened a new room in their art form. The, the analogy is closer, if I say Shakespeare, only because um, if you said, like Charlie Parker or something, who came along and truly revolutionized jazz, it wasn't that after Ray Robinson, every boxer, like after Charlie Parker, every saxophone player played Charlie Parker. Whereas with Ray Robinson, it was more like suddenly there came along someone who was just sort of up here. Muhammad Ali was greatly influenced by Ray Robinson. Um, I would freely admit that. Muhammad Ali is an homage to Ray Robinson. Watching Ali fight, you saw someone aspiring to be Ray Robinson. He was the heavyweight Sugar Ray Robinson. Muhammad started wearing, you know, the same kind of stuff that he wanted to dance like, uh, like Sugar Ray. And he would say it a lot when he's training. And this is where Sugar Ray comes in, you know, and he'd go through that body thing. A few weeks after the third fight with Alano, he was inducted into the Army. He was assigned to the Joe Lewis Troop, 
which was a group of boxers headed, of course, by the heavyweight champion. They toured around army bases in the United States trying to foster good relationships between the black and the white troops. But obviously down south they had a different idea of what was a good relationship because uh, when they got to Mississippi, Ray discovered that the black troops were not allowed to come to see the exhibition. So what he did is he confronted the general at the post and said if there weren't any black troops there, there wouldn't be any exhibition. So a quick call to the War Department and that was another victory for Ray Robinson. The Army decided to send the group overseas. We were having great racial problems, uh, particularly in, in England. And uh, Mr. Robinson decided that was not for him. So when the group left the port of embarkation, Ray was among those missing. He was soon going to be shipped out to Europe, but uh, Robinson didn't want to go. He was informed that if he did not follow orders, he could be court-martialed and punished. What eventually happened is Ray Robinson claimed to have fallen down the stairs. Ray's story was that he tripped, fell downstairs, had amnesia, woke up in, a, in an army hospital in Staten Island, and that led to his discharge. Now, that has always been Ray's story. Not everyone agrees with that story. Dan Parker in the Daily Mirror wrote that Ray had, in a sense, jumped ship, and that became the popular acceptance of what happened. Ray was honorably discharged, which is a point that he always bolt up whenever his military career was questioned. But there is definitely some question there as exactly what happened. When Ray was discharged from the Army, he had been widely recognized as the best welterweight in the world uh, for a long time, but he couldn't get a title shot. And basically, I think the reason he couldn't get a title shot is that, quote unquote, he would have darkened the division. He would have been a black fighter who would have dominated all the white welterweights, weights, and that's not really what sold a lot of tickets. Eventually, it became obvious that Ray Robinson was getting the shaft, and the public pressure built, and eventually he was allowed to fight Tommy Bell for the vacant title. During the fight, Bell, in fact, knocked him down, knocked Ray right on his nose. But Ray got up and won the decision, and now he was the welterweight champion, and he kept going from there. Six years after turning pro, Ray is finally the world champion in 1946. From there on, the problem was finding suitable challengers. Jimmy Doyle was a very good fighter out of Cleveland, and it was a big fight in Cleveland because Doyle was a big draw in Cleveland. The night before the fight with him, I, I dreamed in my sleep that I knocked him out and he died in the ring. And I got up that morning and I told the commission that I wasn't going to fight. The two religious men were brought in to speak to him and said, Ray, this is obviously just a dream. But it turned out he, it was a prescient dream because he killed Doyle with a single left hook. Knocked Doyle out and Doyle died. A few days later, there was a coroner's inquest. There were a lot of headlines. Robinson under probe and death of fighter. And the DA said to Robinson, when did you know you had him in trouble? And Ray says, when he signed the contract, I knew I had him in trouble. It's my business to have him in trouble. His mother was convinced for the rest of her life that uh, this had a profound impact on him as a fighter and that mentally he was uh, no longer the same. Ray uh, would say to her often, I didn't mean it, Ma. I didn't mean it. I think it's hard to overestimate the impact killing Jimmy Doyle had on Robinson. If he went into the Doyle fight with a reserve about boxing as an avocation, I think he came out of it really disliking it, knowing he was a genius at it, but not getting any pleasure out of it. You give me the impression that you rather enjoy your work, is that right? No, just the opposite, Ed. I've never enjoyed boxing. I, uh, I just, it's just a business with me, and I guess I just, I know I've never enjoyed it. He just did it for the money. Put in, get you out of the situation that you're in, stop your mother from working. Poverty, better things of life. Now that's what he did for me. 